In 1 Peter chapter 2, notice with me as we read from verse 21. I want to use this verse to start tonight. Read verses 21 through 25. We find here in this passage, he says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep gone astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls." Heavenly Father, we do ask tonight for your blessings upon the reading of thy word. And we ask, Lord, that you speak to our our hearts by thy spirit and by thy word. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I had prepared for a character study, and we'll pick that up next week. I was going to speak uh, on Zipporah. Moses' wife. How many has ever done a study on Moses' wife? You didn't even know he was married, did you? Uh, but anyway, we'll be looking at her next Wednesday night. I have a reason for reading this text here this evening, and that I will tell you why after the service, and to remind each of us that we're accountable to one another, and we're to exhort one another, pray for one another. I want to title the message this evening, Words, Attitudes, and Actions. Words, Attitudes, and Actions. And what this is, it's basically um, verses that we have used in the last five years dealing with different subjects and still yet relate to the subject of our speech, our words, our attitudes, our actions. A number of years ago, we had had an um, anniversary service meeting here we, that we have the first Sunday of every May, and a friend of mine over in Mississippi kept asking me to come, he asked, actually asked me to come and preach for him a number of times. He's a black minister in Mississippi, and we, we became friends. Had a church of, I think, between three and 400 people. And this has been many years ago, but myself and my wife, after the anniversary meeting later that day, we decided to go over. I didn't tell him I was coming because I just wanted to hear him preach. And we took three of our church members with us. And as this man finished preaching on that Sunday night, and it was a very thriving church, a very fervent spirit, uh, him and I, the pastor, him and I were on the same radio station. That's how we got connected with each other. But after preaching a message one night, that particular night, he called a person in the congregation and asked him to stand. Now, we're talking about a good 300 people there that night, Sunday night. And he pointed out an individual and asked him to stand. And he began dealing with them publicly because they had been rude to their boss. What is interesting that night is that that person repented and promised that they would go and immediately apologize the next morning to their boss. But it just about caused revival. Another one stood up and said, I I want to repent of not being faithful to church. Another one stood up. It says, I ask God to forgive me. And so we want to speak this evening on the subject of words, attitudes, and actions. And I want you to notice, as we come back here, and we've read this many times, we've written on it, and we'll read it many times in the future, if the Lord tarries. But notice that Jesus Christ, in verse 21 is called our example. He's called our example. We don't need examples in the world. You can find some from the Bible, maybe, and from the church history, 
but our greatest example is Jesus Christ. And he says in verse 21, For even here in two were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. So we are called. Jesus Christ is the perfect example. And we are to follow his faith and his practice. Follow in his steps. Let his steps be a pattern for our Christian life. So we are called in verse 21 to suffer also, even endure unjust sufferings as Christ did. And we are called to respond against unjust sufferings as Jesus Christ did. Not in retaliation, whether it be words or actions or attitudes. Now notice in verse 22, it says in verse 22, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Notice he did not sin ever with his mouth, and neither should we. And notice it says in verse 23, he says in verse 23, Who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, He threatened not, but committed himself to him, that is, God the Father, that judges righteously. I want you to think about these words tonight because I have something to talk to you about afterwards. But I want you to think about these words. Jesus Christ did not revile back when he was reviled. Neither did he threaten back when he was threatened, but he committed himself to the Father in this passage. But not only that, I want you to notice in chapter 3, and notice with me in verse 8. Chapter 3 and verse 8. You see, Jesus Christ did not retaliate or threaten, neither did he get mad and lose his cool or fly off the handle as we use it, the Lord Jesus Christ did not do any of those things. He says here in chapter 3, reading in verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one to another, love as brethren, be pitiful, that is to be merciful, be courteous. Now verse 9, not rendering evil for evil. Write down 1 Thessalonians 5.15 also not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereof called, in other words, we're called to bless and not retaliate, that you should inherit a blessing. And I would ask you to write down verses 8 through 12 as far as the context is concerned. Turn with me please to Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4 this evening. Now the Bible tells us that all of our words come from our heart. In Mark chapter 7 verse 21 through 23. And so I have, I have a number of sermons on the tongue. I have one titled Sanctified Speech. I have one titled in 2012, Our Words. And I had a five-point message. I spoke about the fact that our words are to be truthful. They're to be edifying. They're to be gracious. They're, they're to be a blessing. And they're to be thankful. That was in probably one of the last sermons just from like James chapter 3. So when we come to the Scriptures... There is no excuse ever for rudeness or harshness, ever. We never see that in the Lord Jesus Christ, never. Now, He's our example. You hear me throughout the year, at least every three months, refer to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. We find there is no excuse for somebody saying, I've got a temper, or somebody getting mad and blowing off, And, you know, uh, especially on a regular basis. Let us respond not like the lost do, but respond like the Lord Jesus Christ. 
How many times have you ever seen somebody blow off and then they just, well, I didn't really mean that. I don't believe that. I believe you meant exactly what you said when you said it when you were in your anger. I believe the first words that come out of somebody's mouth, I usually take those and let those be you know, the foundation of what they've said because it's come from the heart. doesn't matter where it's in calmness or out of anger. They meant what they said. Now, notice with me as we come to Colossians chapter 4. Now, the heart is mentioned 830 times, and there's only three times, I believe, that it refers to the physical organ that pumps blood in our physical body. And so the heart has to do with the center of man, spiritually speaking. And so we find that our words come from the heart. Again, Mark 7, verse 21 through 23. And there's many other verses that tell us that. So if we don't, now listen to me tonight, if our words come from our heart, if we don't get this right in our words, what is our Christianity worth? I want you to think about this tonight. If we cannot speak words of grace seasoned with salt, what worth is our Christianity and our testimony? I mean, what good is it if we never get control of our tongue? What good is it? Now, notice in Colossians chapter 4, and we, we covered this. I'm trying to think of the name. I just happen to remember this. This is another, um, this is another, another, uh, passage where we dealt with the tongue. And that was only about two years ago. And I think it's titled Con- Conversation and Conduct or something like that. But notice now in Colossians chapter 4, reading two verses. I'm reading in verse 5 and verse 6. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Now, we just preached recently about redeeming the time. But who are those that are without? Somebody tell me. The lost. Okay, walk in wisdom toward them that are lost. Okay? Now, notice with me in verse 6. In verse 6. Now, what we're dealing with here in these two verses is speech. Speech is to always be with grace, seasoned with salt, and to know how to answer every individual. So he says in verse 6, he said, let your speech be always with grace. We know what grace is. Grace has the ideal of favor in which we do not deserve. And we love to talk about the grace of God, but are we gracious toward others in our words? And in their actions. And we find here that our words are to be empowered by God. Gracious words with spiritual content. Not foolishness or jesting or things of that nature. And so he says here in verse 6, Let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt. You see, grace is is to direct what we say. It is one of God's attributes when we talk about grace. It's loving favor toward us. So our words are are to be connected with one of His attributes because He is a gracious God. And then He says here that, that they're to be seasoned with salt, spiritually speaking. He's talking here. In other words, free from corruption. Our speech is to be free from corruption because salt is a seasoning. In other words, it's for flavor. Try to eat popcorn without it. It's hard to do. And it is a purifier. It's a symbol uh, of purity. In other words, sterile words. Sterilized words. And it is a preserver. It, it, It is for protection from corruption. I mean, before refrigeration, salt was used to preserve meat. Now, as we read this, he says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. 
So he's referring to the lost in verse 5, and he's referring to all men in verse 6, including those who are saved. Now, in Colossians chapter 3, we find, and I'm just going to spend just a little bit of time on this, and we see this again in Ephesians 4. But in Colossians chapter 3, there's some things that we're to put off and some things that we're to put on as being Christians. He says in verse 8, But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. In verse 12, he said, Put on therefore as the elect of God. And he gives a long list. He speaks of... Um, uh, that which is holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, um, he says, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, uh, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. We have one whole chapter on charity, 1 Corinthians 13. We have one whole chapter just on the tongue in James chapter 3. And then in James 1.26 speaks of the tongue. So, So we find here in these passages clearly what God has called us to do. And if you back up just for a moment in Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, we basically have the same words. But he tells us in verse 18... He says, 8 verses 17, 18 and 19, he said, Let us not walk as other Gentiles walk. Then he said in verse 22, That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, he begins speaking again about the tongue, about her actions, about her attitude. He said in verse 25 or 29, rather, let no man corrupt, let no corrupt rather communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. He gets in chapter 5 and he comes back with this again. Uh, He says, uh, verse 4, he said, Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Many places in the Word of God we see the issue of our conversation. Many passages. We're to put off the old man. We're put off the conversation of the old man with his deeds. And we're to put on the new man a new conversation. We're told in Ephesians 4.15 to speak the truth in love. Now notice with me in Philippians chapter 1 while we're here close. Philippians chapter 1. This is why we're told throughout the Scriptures, for instance, 1 Peter 5, verse 5 through 7, uh, to walk in hum- humility. Hebrews chapter 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. In Galatians 5, verses 17 through verse 24, the fruit of the Spirit is contrasted with the works of the flesh. We spent probably 15 weeks in that section. I hope that it's helped us. And the fruit of the Spirit begins like this, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, We covered every one of those words in detail. And then just some of the works of the flesh that's associated with our subject tonight would be hatred, variance, emulation. Variance is to vary from the truth of God's Word. Emulation is is, uh, jealousy. And then he says in wrath and strife, strife, seditions, and envyings. We spent many hours on this. And notice in Philippians 1 and in verse 27, he says here in this passage, he says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now sometimes conversation 
can be words only, and sometimes it can refer to words and our conduct, which both of them go together. They really cannot be separated. Notice with me as we would turn to uh, the book of Matthew in chapter 5. In Matthew in chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the first of the Lord's discourse to His disciples to instruct them um, on how to live in view of the coming kingdom. Now, come here. notice as we come here to chapter 5, I'm going to just read the first few verses and then toward the end. And by the way, in, in this discourse, you have in chapter 7 and verse 12, the golden rule that is called by many, that we would do unto others as we'd have them to do unto us. Um, notice in Matthew chapter 5, I want to begin reading in verse 1. I just want to read through the, the first few verses here. Uh, the first 12, pro, we'll go through the first 12 verses and write down 13 through 16 where we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that our good works are to shine forth in this world. Now when we come to the Sermon on the Mount, virtually every part of this sermon is elsewhere in the New Testament. And it's, it's the laws of the kingdom, high standards given to the believer. It, this is the, the essentials of Christianity is what we're going to be reading. And the first part of this that we're going to be reading speaks of character and conduct. He says in verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went into a mountain, and when he sat, was set, set rather, his disciples came to him, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now, I'm hoping in a few weeks preach a message from verse 3. And we have a message on it a number of years ago in this series on Sermon on the Mount. But notice he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Humility. Humility. Notice he says in verse, uh, uh, that's verse 3, verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for well, they shall inherit the earth. Verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, in verse 8, for they shall see God. Verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now notice the next three verses. I fear sometimes that we as Christians overlook so much of the Scripture. I've told two people this week, they've asked me, why do people respond a certain way? I said, we're not really believing what we read. We're not really, th these things are not getting in our heart. We've got our minds made up as what Christianity is, and, and, and we're, just, we're just reading them, but they're not meaningful to us. Verse 10, 11, and 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall do, say rather, all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before them. Well, the interpretation of that in modern Christianity, even Baptist, is that... Is that uh, uh, in verse 12, don't rejoice and don't be glad and uh, retaliate. That's the ideal of many professing Christians today. I've got my rights and I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's how we think, especially in this country. But this is God's Word. This is the living Word. If God was sitting in here with us tonight, if the Lord Jesus, this is what He would be saying to you and I in order to be His disciples. Amazing statements. Notice with me in verse 44. Now, if you read from verse 43 through 48, you'll see what true Christians really look like. I'm going to read verse 44, but he said in verse 45, he said that you may be the children of your Father. And then in verse 48, but you be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. In verse 44... Now notice this, this fits in with everything else. Again, I've just collected um, these verses from the last four or five years of preaching on different subjects. 
And he says in verse uh, 44, but I say unto you. Now this is, let me read verse 43 with it. And ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. Now watch what Jesus said. He said in verse 44, He said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's not what we hear among most people today. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 33 through verse 37. Notice here. By the way, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 5.11. And you remember the man that was committing fornication in the church? And he said to remove him. Well, in the same context of that passage, those who would be worthy to be placed under church discipline, he mentions those that you're not to have company with. If a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, he says, not even eat with them. If somebody professes Christ and they're guilty of these things. But what is interesting in the passage is that he's got the, the railer, the railer. That's the person that scoffs and slanders and insults and accuses. And he's saying, don't even sit down and eat with them. He says here in chapter 12 of Matthew, notice carefully as we come here. He says in this passage, I'm I'm reading from verse 33. And he says here, either make the tree good. And his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh? So anytime we speak words, it's coming from within us, from our very being. And he says in verse 35, and a good man out of a, out of a good heart, a good, I'm sorry, a good man out of the good treasures of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Words are the evidence of what has taken place inside the heart. And our words, and, and, and many times, again, people will make statements, well, I didn't really mean that. No, repent of it if you didn't mean it. And don't say it again. That's the way to fix that. First Peter chapter 3. But notice, before I return, verse 36, notice that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. It's a scary verse. We'll stand with our words in the day of judgment. Turn, turn to First Peter, back to First Peter chapter three, and and notice here. You see, when we we've been dealing with a lot of things in recent years that that many people just overlook. And, and it may sound a little repetitious at times, but God, listen, if we can't get this right, what else matters? If we don't get, if we cannot control our mouth, then our heart is not controlled. There's something desperately wrong. And so, we, these things must be fixed. I had, I've told you about a preacher friend of mine. I told you about a preacher friend of mine that he would get mad so easily. And I, we would talk about that. And he said, that's just the way I am. I got a, I got a, I got a temper. And, and he, I've seen it flare up. We haven't been friends for many years. But I see it. And, and he would justify it. He would try to find a scripture to justify blowing off and steaming off and, and saying things that uh, he would regret later. We don't have to live that way. We don't have to live that way. Say what we mean and mean what we say. 
Let it be thought about before we speak. I'm reading one verse. And actually, uh, in, in, in the text here, let's see, first, yeah, first Peter chapter three. Yes, I, I just need one verse here. Notice with me as we come to first Peter three and in verse 15. Now we just read a moment ago in verse nine. Keep in mind that we just read in verse nine, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that, knowing that ye are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. We are called to bless and not retaliate and to rail. Now notice uh, in verse 15, for, uh, he says here, but sanctify. Now that word means to be set apart. And, and we actually have two sermons on this one verse. And one of them is called sanctified speech. And the other one, I can't remember the name of it, but it was preached probably within the last three years. But notice he said, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words, give Him a rightful place in our lives, in our hearts. And he says here, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So as we look at this, we're to give the Lord a place in our heart. And as we speak to other men, we're to speak with meekness and fear. We're to watch and be careful with our words. We find here the heart must be right in order to have right speech. I want to keep going back to that. What comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. It's like a bucket going down in the well. What the bucket brings up is what is in the well. And this word meekness means gentleness, humility, controlled power and strength. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verse 23. And the word fear here has the idea of reverence toward God, a sense of all, honor and respect, and and, uh, and just being afraid or fearful of violating God's holy word. James chapter 3. In James chapter 3. And notice here. The entire chapter is dealing with the tongue. But I'm going to come down and begin reading in verse 9 through 18. I want you to notice the tongue. The tongue is the accurate index of our spiritual condition. He says here, beginning in verse 9, He said, Therewith bless we God, and even the Father, and therewith, speaking of the tongue now, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, notice this, his works with meekness of wisdom. If ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy, and with and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. He's saying that blessings and cursings should not come from the same mouth. And he's saying here that there's two kinds of wisdom. There's one that is from heaven and there's one that is from hell. He's making it very clear that there is two different types of wisdom here in this passage. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And notice here I'm reading from verse 4. You're taking notes. Romans 12, 14. 
Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Verse 17, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Verse 21, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 13, verses 8-10, through 10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Romans 15, verses 1-7, through 7, the Lord Jesus speaks of this. Verse 2 of that passage, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Now notice with me in 1 Corinthians 13, the entire chapter is charity. All I'm going to do is read. I'm going to read from verse 4 through 8. And by the way, he tells us in the first three verses, he tells us that we can do great things and know all mysteries and basically even give our body to be burned at the stake. And if we don't have charity, all of it is vain. It's useless. That's how important this is that we're talking about tonight. Now, verse 4, beginning here. And before I read, let me just say that when we talk about charity, this is a God love. What we're going to read in these verses, it is kind, it is long-suffering, it is humble, it speaks the truth, it loves the truth, and it rejoices not in iniquity. Verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. In other words, it's not jealousy. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not boastful. It's not puffed up. It's not prideful. Doeth not behave itself unseemingly. Doesn't get mad and blow apart and do things and say things that you regret later. It seeketh not her own. It's not self-centered and self-serving. And is not easily provoked. Isn't that good? Charity is not easily provoked. And it thinketh no evil, and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Turn with me to Ephesians 6. We're getting close. We're going to read here and give you a few extra verses. And then we're going to turn to Psalms 19 and close. Notice in Ephesians chapter 6. Let me read the first three verses. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm interested in verse 2. And verse 2 is found in Exodus 20, verse 12, the fifth commandment of the ten. It's found again in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 16. Found again in Leviticus 19, I think it's verse 32, if I'm not mistaken. Now the word honor here, the word honor here is used about four, uh, about 146 times in the Bible. And to honor, I mean, there's a multitude of synonyms that could be used. But this honor that he's speaking of is forever. He says, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, when he talks about children obeying their parents, they obey their parents until they become an adult. That's temporary. But to honor is forever. And we find that it means to respect, to value, to hold in high esteem, and to speak well of. Now, there's other synonyms, but for the sake of our study here tonight, it means, I'm going to just say, The word honor means to respect and to value, to esteem, and to speak well of. doesn't mean you can't disagree with your parents, especially if they're not Christians. But what we're talking about is always and forever honor them. Always and forever. He says, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. The Lord Jesus 
in John 19, 26 through 27, honored his mother all the way to the end of his life. While he's hanging on the cross, he's concerned about his mother. And as a child in Luke 2, verses 40 through 42, he was obedient as a young child. So he, he obeyed both of the text here, obeying and honor. But he honored his mother as he was dying on the cross, telling the disciple John to take care of her. Take her into his home and take care of her. Now why do I turn to this passage, and, and it's not closing, we're going to close in Luke 19. But he says, Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. My dad died next month will be 16 years ago. And my mother is 87 and a half years of age. I cannot believe the way that some people speak to and of their parents. We're not talking about you have to agree with everything as an adult. I can't even imagine some of the things I hear out of people's mouth of even saying to my father when he was alive or my mother. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. But I'm just amazed at how people treat their parents today and what they say to them. And grandparents as well. Let us turn to Psalms 19 and close. Psalms 19. I'm going to read the three verses that we sing. Psalms 19, the last three verses of the passage. Do you know the Lord Jesus in Mark 7, verses 9 through 13? That He shows what it means to honor the father and mother, and he rebukes spiritual leaders for failing to do so? I mean, just read that sometime. They sinned against God in breaking this commandment in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. Now, these are spiritual leaders that he rebuked. Now, notice as we come here, I'm reading three verses in closing. Now, again... As I'm preaching, I've already thought of two other sermons that I have on words. And again, I just gave, mentioned one of them in Colossians 4. We have an entire sermon in Colossians 4 in verse 5 and 6. I just happen to think of that uh, because we just did what the book of Colossians just a few years ago. It hasn't been that long. And, uh, and if I thought long enough, we probably have got, well, we've not only preached from James, but we've got a series on James. So there's another um sermon in our series on James, not counting the tongue and sanctified speech, and then one in 2012 titled Our Words. So we have have dealt with this. Let us close here in this passage. He says here in verse 12, 13, and 14, and again, we sing this. I love this little text, don't you? He says here, he says, Who can understand his errors? Well, only God can. And he said, Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant. This is David's prayer. Keep back thy servants also from presumptuous sins. That is, deliberate, willful, intentional sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression... Now here it is, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth, see the connection in the mouth and the heart? You can't get, you can't divide them. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I want to sing that last part there. Notice the connection between the words, the mouth, and the meditation of the heart. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank You tonight for Thy love and mercy and grace. We thank You for the privilege.
that you've given us assembly together here tonight. And thank you for each one that's here. We ask, Lord, thy blessings upon the remaining of the service. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.